Welcome to the Rideshare Guy podcast, where you will learn about the rideshare and mobility industry straight from Harry Campbell, who's got over five years experience covering the industry and has talked to thousands of drivers. There's no better place to stay up to date, entertained, and educated. So let's dive in. All right, so I recently listened to an interview on the Pivot Schooled podcast with Kara Swisher and Scott Galloway with Uber CEO Dara Khosrowshahi. As many of you know, I recently interviewed Uber CEO uh, Dara on my podcast and YouTube channel, and uh, you know I'm a little biased, but I thought it went well and it was very fascinating. And one of the people that I've sort of always looked up to over the years when it comes to interviewing, and as you guys know, I'm not a real journalist, but I do uh, you know like to call myself a blogger or YouTuber here and there, a podcast. Uh, is Kara Swisher. So I was really excited because I know she always does the best interviews and seeing how I, how I just came off my interview with him, I wanted to see what questions she asked him and it turned out to be a great interview. So what I wanted to do today was a little bit of a different style of episode. I'm actually going to play back the interview that Kara and Scott did with Dara, but I'm going to share some reaction here and there. So totally new format. You may love it. You may hate it. Let me know in the comments, in the feedback. Shoot me an email if you like it. I think it was a super insightful interview. So at a minimum, you're going to learn a lot from this interview, and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy my commenta- commentary too. You know, I'll be chiming in with my two cents, and uh, if you like this format, we can definitely do more of it in the future. We'll leave a link if you want to listen to the full episode of the Pivot School podcast and just in general, highly recommend that you subscribe to Pivot, uh, which is Kara Swisher uh, and Scott Galloway's podcast. I love both of them and all of their content. So uh, let's get into it and uh, hear the interview and my feedback too. Hi, Dara. Hi. No problem. Uh, Welcome to Pivot School. That's Scott Scott there. I don't know if you've heard of him. He, He says some not nice things about you. You know, you know, what's funny is uh, if you guys have listened to Kara and Scott for a while, especially Scott, he is not a fan of Uber and he's talked a lot of crap about Uber. And uh, I don't know about Dara specifically, but, you know, he's just not the biggest fan of sharing economy and Uber. So I was really interested to see, you know, when you now have the CEO, uh, you know, in person or at least, you know, over Zoom and doing an interview, how do, how do you treat them? Do you sort of still talk about the same amount of crap or you're going to take it easy? So we'll see how he does. Dara, anyway, you and I have met, but you don't remember. Hold on, hold on. It's time to talk <laughs> okay. about our favorite subject, Scott. Do you know, Dara, do you know you and I met like 20 years ago? I do you know not know He doesn't that. remember. I'm not going to pretend to remember. It's like every woman I've ever met. I'm not going to pretend to remember. You were the CFO of Expedia, and I was pitching you on some ridiculous travel startup I had. And you were very friendly and welcoming and very gracious. So good to see you again, Dara. I know that you've been thinking a lot about me and my startup. <laughs> I've, I've been and listening to you. sorry things haven't worked out for you. I see you haven't been up to anything in 20 years, man. Call me if you need some help. Seriously, brother. All right, okay. Yeah, so I love Scott. This is one of the reasons why. He, he's a pretty funny guy, and he definitely uh, self-deprecating, but also you know keeps things lively in addition to good business insight. So uh, this is a good warming up for the interview. Okay, all right. We're going to go right, right, Scott. I'm so glad you didn't take Scott's company or idea. It's so such a smart, you're obviously, you've risen in, in my estimation by far. Anyway, we have a lot of questions for you, but if anyone in the audience has a question for Dara, put them in the Q&A box. We already have a lot of questions. Um, so Dara, you've been all over the place lately with lots of ideas and a lot of actions. Uh, let me just start. You, you, in your recent op-ed published in the New York Times, you said a majority of drivers don't want to be employees because they value flexibility, which Vanessa just discussed. Yeah, and so right before this interview with Dara, they interviewed someone named uh, Vanessa Bain from, a, I think, some organizing group. And actually, I think she's uh, tw- tweeted at me before. I don't think she's a fan. I know she's not a fan of mine. I uh, use some sort of, sort of rather uh, vulgar language, but that's a story for another day. Um, I think Dara's interview was uh, much more insightful than the first one. So um, let's listen. Talk about this a little bit. What? 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 And then secondly, you're you're gonna. It's closed down in California tomorrow. Is that correct? Tomorrow or the next day? Um, and this was recorded a few weeks ago. So that's sort of why they're talk talking a little about bit that. about what you've been up to thinking, like what you're trying to accomplish here. Sure, sure. So uh, whether we close down or not is really up to the courts and it's totally out of our control uh, at this point. Uh, and, you know, we will comply uh, just as any company uh, should and, and would. Um, I think that. For us, what we're trying to achieve is like the new way that you talked about, Kara. Uh, and and I think you could definitely call us guilty. Well, why didn't you get there earlier? Uh, but we don't think that the answer to where we are now is to essentially go back 50 years. We actually do think that we can combine the best of both worlds. 
uh, and it is the flexibility of gig in employment. And there is a trade-off between flexibility and, and employment. I'll talk about that, along with uh, minimum earning guarantees uh, for us per mile reimbursement of expenses, healthcare benefits, medical disability coverage, protection against discrimination, which anyone should have, and harassment and safety standards. We're trying to now lead to actually a better solution, which is every the the vast majority of our drivers, uh, of drivers who drive on the platform and couriers, they value flexibility. They do not want employment, but they do want the protections associated with employment. And what Prop 22 is about is about starting to move into the best of both worlds. Uh, you've got flexibility, you're your own boss, you're your own CEO, but you do have these protections. And I might add that the surveys that indicate that the vast majority of drivers who drive on Uber or Lyft don't want employment, these are actually surveys done by third parties. Like the Rideshare Guy is a blog. I'd encourage people to go on it. I go on it all the time. It's very, very critical of Uber or Lyft. They're not wording anything in any specific way. Uh, and the latest survey that I looked right, at, seventy-one percent of drivers want to be independent contractors. Seventeen percent wanted to be employees. So these are not like surveys that we're doing and we're loading up with uh, complex language to lead anyone but, in the wrong direction. Getting- well, appreciate the shout out, Dara. And, uh, you know, I actually, you know, kind of agree with that. I think one of the earlier, uh, Vanessa earlier, I talked about, and there, there's some reports that I think are totally misguided and flawed to talk about how drivers don't understand the questioning. And my surveys are very simple. It's what do you prefer, independent contractor or employee? And so I think it's sometimes funny because uh, the proponents of becoming employees in AB5, you know, they, they sort of want to find every single reason to find some flaw with something when at the end of the day, you know, it kind of makes sense. Most drivers are part time and, uh, most want to be independent contractors like that shouldn't be a shocking survey result but for some people it is and then instead of you know discussing the very real caveats to that you know the fact that uber and lyft don't really you know drivers want to be independent but uber and lyft don't really treat drivers like independent contractors you know they focus on kind of calling uh, you know very simplistic surveys flawed and uh, you know the, i think the whole Prop 22, uh, AB5 debate, you know, you can kind of tell Dara has his talking points and he's definitely on point there. But uh, I, I do think, you know, that there's there's some kernel of truth in what he's saying. But let, let's hear what uh, Kara has to say. To the point she was making is, of course, everyone doesn't want to be wants to be calling themselves independent. But is it really I mean, look at through this this COVID crisis. It's just shown how unprotected many of these gig workers are at the same time accelerating the amount that we need in this economy. And I think, you know, I've called them, I think you've heard sacrificial workers, you and I have discussed this and them not having any employment does have a set of rules that go with it that are are very strict. This does not. You know, there's sort of, and then this this COVID crisis has pointed out that they're under siege and also in danger, as, as, and don't have any anywhere to go if since they aren't employees, even if they like flexibility, if they like not having a boss. I love this uh, being able to mute everyone and put everyone on pause. I hope you guys are enjoying this format too. We'll see what the feedback is like. But I think actually I kind of disagree. You know, one thing that I I thought that at first, you know, what Kara was saying, but one thing with COVID, because the government bailed out gig workers, you know, included them in unemployment, I think a lot of the flaws of the gig economy that would have been exposed otherwise, you know, the lack of safety net, a lot of drivers, you know, really aren't seeing that, right? Because they basically were bailed out by the government. And this isn't exclusive to gig workers. A number of industries, small businesses, you know, everyone was kind of bailed out by COVID. So you might have thought that would happen, but I really don't think that's been the case. And we did do a survey asking drivers about how they felt about employee versus independent contractor before and after COVID. And it really wasn't a huge change relatively. I think it was you know, like he Dara said, it went up to 71%, but it was a small, um, it was just a little bit higher than that before uh, COVID too. So um, still most people, it's kind of same before and after. Well, I think as far as safety goes, um, you're absolutely right. These are folks who have to leave their home to do their jobs, unlike us, uh, right? Mm-hmm. And what we've done is we we have been leaders on the flexibility front. We we committed Fifty million dollars to uh, to personal kind of equipment. We're shipping over thirty million masks to drivers and couriers to either to their homes or, or they can come uh, pick it up. We gave over twenty million of aid to drivers 
so that they didn't feel like they had to go earn if they were feeling sick. Uh, and we were the first across the board in the industry to do it. We require now drivers to take a selfie, make sure they're wearing a mask. If a rider is not wearing a mask, the we have uh, we have essentially on the app feedback there. So I think on the safety front, we have stepped forward. We keep we can keep innovating on the safety front. By the way, a lot of other folks copied us. Yeah, but that, I think socially you're right. Again, that's, on, that's, ta- that's table yeah. stakes. You should do that. Period. That's good for your sure. business. Like Agreed. that's not like a fa- yeah. it's not a favor for workers to do that. Yeah, and this is why I think Kara is such a great interviewer. She really tells it like it is. You know, I think all of that stuff is table stakes. You know, I think one of the reasons why Uber does a lot of that is so that the CEO can then go on podcasts and say, hey, you know, we did 50 million this. That sounds like a lot. I don't know. Is it? Is it not? You know, what I will say that I do agree with Dara that they have been the leader, but I think it's because many of the other companies were so slow, so bad. Um, You know, in those early days of the pandemic, I mean, Uber was telling their employee workforce to go work from home, but they weren't even providing PPE to drivers yet. So sort of that dual class uh, citizenship, uh, you know, between employees and independent contractors, which I'm sure they'll get into more that, you know, I think eventually they did do sort of what's right and what's best, but I I wouldn't, you know, so in a way they're right that they were the leader, but I still think, um, you know, they were a little too late in my opinion. And uh, I did actually interview Andrew McDonald from Uber, who is in charge of their whole COVID response. If you're interested in checking that out, definitely give that a listen. We went into all the details there about what Uber did and didn't do. So what? We, so uh, what the I'm, idea I'm that they want good. more than that? Yeah, there's more. There's more and, than that for them. They need more that they can like one thing and also want other rights. Well, absolutely. So the table stakes we led on, uh, and mm-hmm. it is table stakes. And then what we're now proposing actually is flexibility with benefits, with disability coverage, et cetera. And again, I'll I'll say, did it take us too long to get there? Yeah, but we're here. And we actually want to have a real dialogue as opposed to, you know, some of the dialogue that I'm hearing around. Scott? So, uh, first off, you may not know this about me, Kara. I'm a member of a union, the UAW. As a part-time okay. professor, I, I pay union dues. So, okay. Dar, first okay. off, Prop 22 has a clause in there that someone snuck in that if it's passed, they'll need a 7-8 supermajority vote to unionize, which is basically outlawing unions, as I see it. But I want to go meta for a second. I looked at the market cap of General Motors as 42 billion. They have 164,000 employees. That's 250,000 in market cap. And on average, their employees make 84,000 plus benefits. For 27 billion, 190,000, 140,000 in market cap per employee, 89,000 plus benefits. Uber, 53 billion with 27,000 full-time employees at HQ. Do I have that number right? 27,000, that's what I found. Is that right? That's about right. Yeah. Approximately? Yeah, that's about right. So about $2 yes. million. Dollars $2 million in market cap, around 15 or 20 times the market capitalization of traditional automobile manufacturers. And then there's this, there's the non-employees, the 4 million drivers. Now, that's the number I got, 4 million. And I looked at so many, there's so many different studies, conflicting studies of how much Uber drivers make. And I erred towards the higher end, the part-time guys after expenses make between nine and 12 bucks an hour. Obviously flexibility is a huge point of compensation. And then full-time riders, because I guess there's some economies of scale, get 38000 without benefits. So it strikes me that if you have these large organizations that are employing six or seven times as many people at three times the salary, but they only have a tenth of the market cap, it strikes me that Uber, at the end of the day, is, like, is literally ground zero for income inequality, that it's figured out a way to have this two-class system. There's the employees at HQ that skew younger, skew college-educated probably skew more white, quite frankly. And they make, call it with compensation and equity compensation and benefits, I would bet between 150 and 250K. And then the 4 million, kind of what I'll call the other part, the, 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 the other side of the tracks makes substantially less. And this arbitrage is amazing for shareholders. I want to acknowledge that. And shareholder growth is really important. But isn't it, with, when we're thinking larger about our society, aren't you really ground zero for income inequality? 
So before Dara answers, you know, I just want to quick uh, fact check some of those numbers because, uh, you know, I think Scott does uh, know, uh, you know, the business side of things well, but I, I think with specific, you know, sometimes in the past with his ride share analysis and Uber and, and Lyft analysis uh, specifically, I've definitely dif- disagreed with some of it. I'm not sure where the 4 million drivers number came from. Um, I literally Uber just announced in that New York Times op-ed, they talked about having 1 million drivers in the U.S. last year in 2019. So I'm going to check with Uber on that and see exactly what they say. But I I think it's closer to one to one and a half million drivers uh, on Uber at least. And then, you know, as far as pay, you know, we've surveyed and there are actually a number of other surveys, but I think generally drivers have reported earning about uh, 16 to uh, $20 an hour before expenses. Expenses can be anywhere from $5, uh, you know, around $5 an hour, I guess I would say is a good ballpark. So I think Scott's figures for part-time uh, sound about right, 10 to 12 bucks an hour. I- I'm not sure though, to be honest, if full-time drivers drivers necessarily make more. Again, there's sort of some variability. Like maybe if you're in San Francisco or LA, a a market with top bonuses, then you could potentially make more because, you know, on a per hourly basis, because you're getting those extra bonuses and incentives. So there's sort of this weird situation that happens when you're part-time, you can kind of cherry pick the best hours and make kind of a good amount on a per hour basis if you're driving the busiest times and places. But as you go more full-time, you sort of start having to drive all the crappy hours and that brings down your hourly but then if you do get bonuses, then that brings it back up. So that's just sort of how I think about earnings there. So let's see what Dara has to say now about the, all that. That's a loaded question. So I th- yeah, th- thank you for that question. The, I think that it starts um, with a false premise in that yep. drivers and couriers who use our system are employees. All right. The, they're not employees we don't tell them what to do they can decide when to work etc this idea that oh you can have flexibility employment at the same time it's just false on the face of it yes it's not illegal for someone to give someone uh full flexibility but like a barista can't come into a coffee shop anytime he or she wants to show up can't say i'm only going to make you know lattes and and i'm not going to make a regular coffee drink can't take a two-hour break during rush and can't then go work at another coffee shop that's closer to home on their way home. So just because it's legal doesn't mean it actually works. So that's one thing that where I'm in total agreement with uh, Uber and Dara on is that, you know, all the proponents of AB5, they, they keep hammering to me that there's nothing in the text of AB5 that says employees have to be, um, you know, scheduled and have to do shifts and all that. And I say, yeah, I get it. But we're living in the real world. <laughs> in the real world, I mean, just think about how many jobs you've had as an employee and think about the flexibility, right? There wasn't much, right? So and I think that's where, again, right, I think there's a legitimate discussion to be had. But if you don't start from a place of reality. Um, you know, of course, there's one thing that the law says, but it's also what's realistic, right? Even if you just think about the example that Dara gave, I think is accurate. I swear that Uber stole that example from me, the Starbucks barista specifically, not the exact, <laughs> all the details, but I've been saying that on and off. Uh, and I'm sure some of you have heard me say that in interviews and writings and podcasts in the past. So I'm pretty sure uh, they owe me a royalty check. But I, I mean, just look at it from a minimum wage perspective, right? If you have to pay drivers a certain amount of money for driving, you can't just let them drive whenever and wherever you want. So that is by nature more restrictive, right? Like, I don't know why, again, I don't know why that's controversial, but uh, for, for some it is. So uh, I think Dara has a good explanation of that later on too. We'll, we'll see what he uh, has to say as follow-up. Um, the reason mm-hmm. why flexibility works on our system is that a someone who wants to earn, and we consider drivers and couriers customers, when they want to earn, they can push a button, they can do it at their own discretion anytime they want or not want. And their interests are aligned in that there are some who want to maximize earnings. And by the way, uh, the study that's based on actual earnings on Uber and Lyft, the most scientific study out there, talks about drivers in Seattle making 23 bucks an hour after expenses. It's 35% more than taxi drivers. It's based on actual data versus survey data. Dara, I thought you'd been listening and watching my podcast, but apparently not because we pretty thoroughly debunked that number. And, uh, you know, the, the headlines, uh, you know, we actually had the author of that Cornell study, Louis Hyman, on the podcast. So you definitely go and check out that interview that I did with him. But, uh, you know, the headline, $23 an hour, used some assumptions that I think were I mean, basically just flat out wrong. Um, they didn't include all of the P1 time. They did include some. Um, and then they actually, you know, that study looked at the 
the city, the uh, city of Seattle, and not the greater metro, which included things like the airport. So, um, you know, basically, you could actually that survey, that study that he referred to, the Cornell study, was amazing. It had it, like he said, it did use actual earnings of Uber and Lyft data and accounted for crossover P1 time. It had uh, it was super rich with data. It was just that headline that they came out with, to sort of you know try and get a bunch of media attention, was uh, basically false, and so I wasn't a fan of that. But I mean, the number is close. So just FYI, Dara, check out my podcast. All these other studies are based on survey data. It's not the real stuff. This is actual data that cannot, you know, people find the, the, the results inconvenient, but they're actually based on real data versus survey data. And just like the person who came before me said, you can really mess around with survey data. So you've got mm-hmm. the interest of the driver is aligned with with what they're doing if they want to be maximally productive they have to give up some flexibility they've got to work center of the city they've got to work at rush hour and those drivers Mm -hmm. make much more if they don't if they if they value flexibility they want to work at 2 a.m wherever they want they want to be close to home they will sacrifice earnings and by the way the more you drive uh, there's actually a premium to experience. Your earnings go up by 14, 15%. You understand the system. You you know how to play the game, et cetera. The minute that you flip to employment, then the mm-hmm. company has to underwrite their earnings. It becomes my job to make sure that drivers are efficient. Um, it makes and and only drive in the the middle of the city, only drive during peak hours, et cetera. And I have to control essentially what that employee does in order to for me to have an arbitrage between what I pay them and how productive they are. So this is one of my favorite parts of the interview, and I think it's really insightful because Dara is hitting on a lot of important uh, basically nuances. And I mean, I think you have to think about, it. I mean, this guy is look running a, you know, 80, 70, 60, 78 billion dollar company. He actually, you know, I will say he knows a lot about the driver experience, even though it's only one small part of the business relatively. And, you know, just the example that he used in talking about, you know, part-time drivers. I mean, really what's happening now is that some drivers are optimizing for making the most amount of money. You know, probably someone like me, people, um, you know, who kind of are out there, you know, maybe they could be part-time, they could be full-time, but they're really thinking about when and where they can drive to maximize the amount of money. And I would say, frankly, probably most drivers aren't thinking about that. Most drivers are just kind of going out there, flipping on the app, taking whatever ride they get, you know, not thinking about, oh, should I take this one? Should I take that one? If I don't, if I, you know, if I'm in a super busy area, I can decline this request that's seven minutes away and I'll probably get one that's closer, you know, two, three minutes away. And that saves me time, money, gas, right? Most drivers aren't really thinking like that. And I think what stood out to me about this part is that that kind of arbitrage that you might call it, or that self-selecting is really the flexibility that a lot of drivers like. Basically, some drivers are kind of opting for making a little bit less, but having a more enjoyable experience, right? Not driving nights, not driving certain places, not driving certain times. And as an employee, Uber wouldn't really be able to get your preferences nearly as individualized. And I think that's what he's sort of, you know, kind of getting into here. So let's hear him continue. So the two just don't get along and don't are are completely different things. Drivers and couriers can earn pushing a button uh, we, over the lifetime of our business, uh, of the amount of dollars that have come into the platform, over 80% go directly to drivers and couriers. Uh, it doesn't go to some you know, offshore entity. It's actually you're recirculating earnings in society, usually locally in a city, usually from people who are wealthier in the middle of the city to, to people who aren't. Um, and, it's, and this kind of work is needed and oh, by the way, people can ditch their cars, and on the on the customer side, you can have something okay. that, that's convenient. So we we ain't GM. We don't want to be GM. Much respect mm-hmm. to them. We're marketplace, mm-hmm. and there's a place in society for that. People are earning on our on the platform, and people are using the mm-hmm. platform to get around. And I think that's a net positive. 
You know, I actually haven't heard that point uh, made by Uber before. I think it's a new talking point. The fact that most of the money, you know, 80% of fares, which I don't think is actually right. I think, uh, you know, their commission alone is 25% of the fare. <laughs> but um, so obviously, and then they take a service fee. So it's closer to 30% usually. But, you know, let's call it 70% of the, what the passenger pays is going back to drivers, you know, and sort of staying locally as opposed to when you buy from Apple. Obviously, you know, it's not going to local people, right? It's going, you know, whatever, abroad, uh, you know, offshore all of the issues that Apple has and the people criticize them there. So, um, you know, it's something I'm just hearing now for the first time, but I kind of, I kind of like it. So whoever came up with that at Uber, I think that was a smart, um, you know, sort of talking point. So tomorrow mm -hmm. you're going to say, you're going to say that employee versus contractor bill is the deadline. What, what, what are you in discussions right now? Or are you just, what will happen tomorrow? Well, we're definitely in discussions. Uh, what will happen tomorrow is the a uh, judge essentially determines whether there's a stay uh, between so that we can be heard in court on the appeal. Uh, if the judge does not grant us a stay, then essentially the service has to shut down until uh, there's the court case. Uh, and hopefully, you know, in November, in Prop 22, we will get uh, voters to vote along with what 71 percent of drivers want. I don't understand. I feel like I've heard this before from Uber. You know, Dara said earlier that, you know, it's it's out of their control. You know, Uber will have to shut down, right? And I mean, I think when you think about it, right, like obviously AB5 has been the law since January 1st, 2020. So they knew that they were supposed to classify drivers as employees starting January 1st. So that's when they knew we're now in August, September. So I mean, it's hard to say that, you know, they're kind of being faced with this ultimatum. I think that they were probably surprised <laughs> that the appeal happened so quickly. And, you know, now that this episode is a few weeks old, we know what happened. Uber, uh, you know, got that stay. And so they didn't have to pull out of California. But I mean, it really happened at the last minute. And I feel like Uber talked, uh, they used a similar, they, they did something similar with rates, I want to say. Um, I think it might have been even when I was interviewing Dara in, in the past, you know, and they talked about, um, you know, we don't set rates, the market sets rates. And I'm like, uh... Uh, are you sure? No, you set rates. And I think that was one thing that I kind of regretted from my, the first interview I did with Dara in person back at a driver event in LA is that I was like so shocked that they said that I like didn't even have time to push or didn't even have the thought to put back push back on that because it was, just seems so ridiculous to me. So again, it's sort of like, I don't know, I definitely don't agree with Uber here that, um, you know, they have that they have no other choice. I mean, they had a choice and their choice was to not, you know, to go through the appeals process. And so I mean, what's done is done. But I don't know, I don't really agree with that. Uh, which so is you, a better you way. will shut down this service in California, you will just we're trying to figure out what to do. Uh, and we have there's a black car service that we have that's based on fleets, etc. Uh, and we are trying to figure out exactly what we do going forward. But the mainline Uber service, it just won't be available because it's based on a completely different model. Is that a disservice to workers? Right. Are, 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 is that yeah, a disservice to the, to the workers? Why did you so make this decision? Of course it is. I mean, these are, these are, these are, it's not up to us. The decision is a court decision. Kara, we can't go out and hire 50,000 people uh, overnight. So I'm really glad again, you know, I, I love Kara's interviews because I'm really glad she brought this up. I think she's sort of like a woman of the people, even though she's this huge successful podcaster and, um, you know, sort of writer, blogger, author, whatever. <laughs> I've done a lot. And, you know, kind of, I think the drivers, like riders kind of get screwed when Uber and Lyft pull out of cities, but drivers are really the ones who get screwed. Uh, you know, this happened in 2016 in Austin. You know, I visited uh, Austin with, with someone and um, we looked at basically, you know, what the landscape was like after Uber and Lyft pulled out of the city. And a lot of people were shocked, surprised, especially the drivers. They were like, hey, overnight, I lost my income stream. I had no money. You know what I mean? And it's sort of like, wow, you know, here's this company who one minute they're telling, you know, people like Kara and even myself, oh, we love workers. We care about them. And then the next minute they're pulling out and they're saying, oh, it's not our fault. It's the courts. You know, we have, you know, we can't do anything about it. And I think that's just kind of like total bullshit. So, um, you know, the one thing that I don't agree on, and, you know, I tweeted something the other day that, you know, they talked about how now the companies are, they were at $110 million in contributions to the uh, Yes on Prop 22 campaign. And I think they kicked in another 30 or 40 million. And so I think to me, like just a small action that kind of, you know, wouldn't cost them a ton. I mean, if they're already spending 140 or 200 million to match that in some sort of, you know, weekly bonus for drivers, for example, it's like, hey, you know, we're pushing for this over here, but at the same time, we understand we're 
going to match that and just pay that as a straight flat bonus based on the number of rides you've done for us this year. So to sort of at least put your money where your mouth is, right? If they're going to pull out of um, you know a state overnight, then maybe it's like, hey, we get that this is going to suck for you, but we're here's what we're going to do for you. You know, we're going to give you some money. Or we're going to give you something, right? Like it shouldn't they shouldn't just be allowed to do whatever they want whenever they want and kind of expect there to be no repercussions. So that's my big uh, bone to pick there. Everything that we have built is based on actually this platform that brings you know earners and brings people who want transportation or delivery together you can't flip that stuff uh over overnight it'll take time and we're going to figure out a way to be in california we want to be in california but if the court case comes in then we'll have to shut down and we got the best engineers in the world figuring out how we can rebuild this thing if we do have to go to employment model what's going to happen is uh, we will then again have to underwrite driver productivity and just from a pure strategy point of view, I think Uber, I don't agree with it, but I think their move was quite brilliant in that, you know, okay, AB5 was the law January 1st, 2020. They basically appealed and didn't comply until this point where, you know, it was like they had 10 days to comply uh, with drivers being employees or they were going to get kicked out or I guess they were going to lose their license. I don't know, something bad, something really bad was going to happen, right? And, you know, in that 10 days, of course, in 10 days, they can't go and hire 50,000 drivers. They could have in the eight or nine months proceeding but yeah in 10 days obviously no one can do that so there you know again there's like some truth to that that hey you know we can't flip a switch and change all our drivers to employees and I think that they obviously were able to put enough pressure on legislators that you know especially right now like a lot of the people need these rides they need money there are a lot of central rides happening and you know ultimately they kind of won that battle and they haven't won a battle with cities or states in, in quite some time so interesting there'll be far fewer drivers employed so my guess is 70, 80% of people who use Uber for flexibility, they drove five to 10 hours, et cetera, they will not be able to earn. Uh, the prices are gonna go up. They're gonna go up less in like city center. So I think SF, you know, prices will go up by 20 something percent. Smaller cities, but prices be, are gonna go way it'll up. It'll be what it would cost. Because, yeah. What the, no, well, I've no, never listen, thought the prices it, were right. Is, but, but, but the prices are right because there are people who value flexibility. There are people who take responsibility. Our drivers know exactly what they're doing. And they they understand our system, they game our system, et cetera, and they earn our so this is sort of where, you know, I, I think like these types of interviews get into that like kind of boardroom, you know, like CEO level investor call type talk, right? Like me as a driver, like if I go out there and do a ride in LA, that's a minimum fare and the passenger pays, you know, their $8 and then Uber takes their $3 cut and then pays me 75% of the rest and I end up with $2.75, I don't want that ride. No driver really wants that ride, but Uber and Lyft sort of force you to take those rides, um, although now they're showing the destination in California in some some cases, but they've got some other workarounds to stop that. But, you know, that's sort of where I just kind of disagree in the sense that you know, uh, Uber and Lyft do have a lot more control than they often, uh, you know, m make it seem like, you know, in interviews like this, right? They kind of, um, they, they do know what they're doing a little bit. And, uh, you know, I, I do think, though, that, you know, that generally we can make some assumptions you know, if drivers were to become employees. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. I think there's a ton. There's probably more unknowns than knowns. But, yeah, it makes sense that they will hire less drivers. Like someone like me who hasn't driven in a few months or, you know, someone that drives every, you know, every other weekend. Like they're a manager's nightmare. We don't want those guys so let's get rid of all of those basically you know part-time um, drivers whoever and um, you know fares will go up accordingly if they have to pay drivers more so I think there's definitely he identifies here a few general trends that you know I think again like I don't know why the AB5 proponents argue with this yes there will be less drivers that's okay let's discuss if that's okay or not and yes prices will go up and as Kara mentioned but you might actually be paying now the true cost of the ride you know maybe if you stopped and thought about it in the past like a four dollar Uber Uber ride, huh? Seems a little too good to be true, right? System the way that they want to, and I think right. that's a good thing. And we want to take it to the next step. All right. So higher prices, etc. That's what we're worried about. Okay, I'm going to ask you one more quick question, then we'll get to the audience. Higher prices, um, we bought post Okay, uh, we bought Postmates earlier this year for more than 2.5 billion. Uh, talk uh, about the restaurants, and then we'll get to some audience questions. And uh, one more, if Scott has another one. Yeah, I think uh, on the restaurant side, listen, what, what you guys were talking about as far as these restaurants closing down, it's it's tragic. It's horrible. They're, they're incredible employers. Uh, we are going out and signing up as many restaurants as we want. 
Um, we are providing now pickup service. Uh, we allow restaurants to use their own couriers if they want to or use us as well. Uh, and right now we're a lifeline for a lot of restaurants out there and frankly, not enough restaurants out there. So we want to go all in and we are going all in on on delivery. It's a 30 billion run rate not including Postmates mm -hmm. and not including Corner Shop. So it's a it's a big part of our business and it's a lifeline for a lot of small businesses. Uh, and, and we think it's, you know, it's a big, big positive for society. Are you taking too much of the money? A lot of restaurants complain about that. And, you know, are you headed for an Apple-like fight with restaurant owners? So our revenue margins, which is essentially our take net of courier costs in that business, uh, is about 13%. Um, Apple's is a heck of a lot higher than that. So we've talked about 15% being the call it take at maturity. And I think that's a fair take rate. Uh, the cost of delivery, the cost of couriers, et cetera, it's a significant cost. Uh, and we're trying to reduce that with like technology batching, having one courier uh, deliver two or more dinners. So technology will slowly bring the cost down, but we think a 13% take now and a 15% take later pretty fair. Scott, do you have a final question? Then we'll ask uh, two questions from the audience. Yeah. So this is just sort of one of the reasons why I'm just not a fan of a lot of food delivery options in general, right? I mean, it's expensive, right? Restaurants are complaining that 30% take rate is too high. And here you have Uber CEO saying, well, we got to pay 15% to the driver. Okay, can't argue with that. You know, it doesn't even sound like a lot, right? They have to get paid to deliver the food. And then Uber obviously has to take a cut for facilitating the transaction. Another 13% right now going up to 15. So that's a total of 30%. I mean, that's a lot for the restaurants. But you know, when you think about it and break it down, it's not a lot of money for each party you know drivers couriers don't feel like they're making enough restaurants feel like they're charging too much and you know maybe uber and actually uber has never been profitable with uber eats so they're not making enough so um a lot of issues with food delivery in my opinion and you know he talked about batching and i think batching sounds great on paper but when you're the person getting the second order that second delivery and food is a very obviously time sensitive item right the longer it takes to get to you the colder it's going to be and the lower the quality it's going to be versus the second ride in an Uber pool, it might take you longer, but you're still going to end up at your destination. You're not going to end up, you know, a thousand yards away from your destination because you were the second rider. The quality of the product isn't diminished in an Uber pool like it is in a batched order with food delivery. So my, mine is more around Dara. You and I are about the same age. Actually, you're five years younger, but that's the same age. Um, about the, the same hairstyle. Like, where do you, there you go. Where do you want to be in five years, boss? You're economically secure. You've kind of rung the bell professionally. Do you want to be, I mean, do you want to build a trillion dollar market cap company? Do you want, do you see this as an opportunity to try and prove Vanessa wrong and lift these 4 million drivers up and give them a better wage? Like what, you know, what, so, is, where so do I you want to be in five years? Yeah, I don't spend that much time thinking about five years. I'm like, Tomorrow is overwhelming in, enough in, in COVID. Yep. Um, but, but listen, I think that there's this unbelievable disconnect between technology and the real world. Uh, and mm -hmm. I look at Uber and we're the one company that can make that connection. We're building technology for the real world for 4 million people who can earn. And if they can earn, and by the way, we're going to get better and more efficient and hopefully take down our take rates so more and more people can earn and more and more people can, can get a higher percentage of their labor and their effort, right? That is really cool. We can be the tech company who every day is living on the streets, who every day is, you know, not looking at diversity theoretically, but has an unbelievably diverse uh, user base in every way and with whom we connect. And like we can be that tech company that can, that can be that great tech company that's not disconnected uh, from the world, that's not sitting, you know, at home on on videos all the time, that's on the ground building amazing technology to make people's lives better in cities and where the money stays in the city and doesn't go to some offshore account. Like if I can be a part of that story, it's awesome. And, and you know, the tech, it's, it's like fun, it's hard, and it's a fight. Um, but I actually think we can make that tech company that can build the bridge to real people and the real world. And All that's right. what I'm in speaking, it for. Speaking of real people, uh, workers, um, is there a, why is there not a driver representative on Uber's board or within the Uber's executive team? Would that help the company be held accountable by those who drive? I've always, all tech companies, I think, should have. Yeah, a so 
so so you we that, have driver we have truck forms all the time i uh, no, i want them I, on the board. I actually think it's I pretty cool them. i, I I actually think, listen, we've we've moved forward on the board right now as far as diversity, et cetera. The board is like right. uh, a really, really great board. I do think that the German model where you have employee representatives yeah. and you have kind of a different yeah. board, I, I think I think that's a cool model. I think I think listen, the the our cool enough system, for Uber? right? Are you announcing that yeah. here? <laughs> yes, great. We're so excited. I would, I, I Why would not? be I would be supportive. I, I would be supportive, honestly. Now we're we are in discussions with uh, drivers and couriers, understanding what they want, we build for them. The product team drives, and and they're building for drivers and couriers. Um, it, I do think you know, we have the system that's optimized. Uh, you know, it's called capitalism. Barry Diller, who's my my mentor, he always said there's power uh, in a name. Like it's not called laborism, it's not called socialism, it's capitalism, and it's a system that's built to maximize shareholder value and capital. And if that's the only input, um, then you're going to keep getting the same results going forward that, that you got going backward. You know, I think there's a great question by Kara, again, her third or fourth great question. And uh, I think I totally agree. I think it makes a lot of sense. A lot of people love this model in Germany, I think, that requires board uh, input because, you know, the board is where it actually freaking matters. You know, like Dara is talking about these driver advisory forums and we're surveying this and that. And, you know, we have our people on our product team actually driving like, guys, come on, you, you know, the top five issues for drivers like the back of your hand it's been the same thing for the past five six years drivers want to be paid more you know they don't want to be deactivated unfairly they want to limit uber's commission rate they don't want too many drivers in a city what is that four things right there like i just read that off the top of my head and you know that's been basically i know it so well because it's been the same four issues for the past six years so this stuff isn't exactly rocket science oh and maybe uh, the other thing that i like is sort of you know basically compensating drivers based on or rewarding drivers based on loyalty and experience so sort of the more rides you do the better rating you have the better benefits or the better pay you get as a driver. That doesn't really happen right now. That's kind of my fifth bonus thing that I uh, aggregated from a lot of conversations with drivers. But I don't know, basically what Dara is saying right here is, yeah, that sounds great, but we'd, we think we would make more money this way. I think that's a simple translation. Uh, so these kinds of systemic changes, you know, I'm game for. Like, I, I, I don't want yesterday's, you know, tw capitalism 20 years ago to be the same 20 years from now. I got that. You said that in the passive voice when you actually have an active power to do so. Just FYI. Just you can actually put your foot in the board. All right. What? We'd like to see um, that. That's what I, I would like to see that. that. Okay. All right. Um, All right game on. Last question Please. here. All right. Game on. Uh, you know how much I poke you on these things. I think that would be great. Um, when will we see an acceleration in automated and driverless customer interactions? That was a big area of investment earlier. Where are you on driverless cars at this moment? It's it's super hard tech to build. Uh, we have a great team um, that can, the advantage that we have is essentially we can automate the simplest, shortest, let's say least value routes relative to the difficulty because we have all that data mm -hmm. in our network. Um, I think it's still gonna be three to five years from now, and but the technology is getting better and it's being built in our being able to grow it inside of our network uh, I think is a huge advantage that is under. So totally agree here. And I mean, I guess basically I think Dara is saying here that autonomous vehicles, like I think he's saying we screwed up um, or maybe he's not saying we screwed up, but I think that, uh, I mean, if anything, you know, like a lot of investors bought into that self-driving narrative, I think stupidly. I mean, it wasn't even close. And like anyone, I think with honestly like half a brain or at least, you know, chose to use that half of their brain at that time could have seen that there's so much uh, that needs to happen on the uh, self-driving technology uh, side of things that it just was going to be so long. And, you know, probably now three to five years is a much more realistic timeline to see these first initial routes. You know, it's not going to be a complete level five, drive anywhere, drive everywhere. And actually, he brings up uh, one interesting uh, advantage that Uber does have. They are going to know some of these sort of short and easy routes that could potentially be deployed on a with AVs. And if they're smart, they'll maybe coincide the ones that, you know, with human drivers don't want to do or don't like doing or don't make much money on or, you know, make them the most amount of money, right? I think there are some interesting 
cities, you know, opportunities, and they're going to have a lot of that data, very similar to how, you know, this whole scooter and bike revolution was born out of all the observations that people were making at Uber, you know, short trips, okay, you know, and all that. So I think that's one unique insight that they'll have. And then the second thing that he doesn't really talk about here, but I think it's going to be super valuable, is that because they're out in the world doing right now, like everyone that I talk to, every Rydale CEO that I ever talked to says it's more expensive and more difficult to operate a rideshare business than they ever would have guessed. And I think people like Elon Musk and others who think that they can just, you know, once they have the technology, get a ride hail fleet up and running does not know what they're in for. And, you know, I, I sort of sum it up by saying, like, who's going to um, rep- what happens when a rider pukes in the back of your self-driving car? Just think about everything that's going to have to go into that one edge case. Someone pees, someone tries to have sex in the back of the car. The You know, there's nowhere to park. There's nowhere to pick up. You know, right now, ride hail relies on so much manual input from drivers that is frankly very easy for for a human, but I think would have to be built in or you'd have to have sensors, which cost money. And there's just so many sort of UI, UX, uh, or I guess that would be um, UX challenges there that they're gonna have to deal with. So just my quick rant on self-driving. Are you gonna run others? Is it gonna be your technology? Cause that, that's a big investment we, for a small we, company. We're, like we're, we're, do you think that there's advantage in building uh, some of this tech in-house? Because again, we can build it to suit for the network, but we will absolutely also work with third parties on the tech. Ultimately, just like we want, you know, any car on the network, we're going to want any robot driver on the network as well. Scott, do you have anything final? Anything else? Yeah, it, it feels to me like, I mean, Uber has pulled off. We talked about this earlier, Dara. Uber has pulled off, assuming it's, it's successful, what will appear to be one of the great pivots. You're no longer really a ride-hailing company. You're a food delivery company. Is that accurate? Well, I, I like to be both. Like, it's, it's to me, if we can be, if we can build... Uh, a real logistics network that gets people from point Mm -hmm. to B, brings anything, commerce from point B to A, uh, that's a really powerful position. Um, So what's the third uh, leg of that stool? Do you get into, do you get into last, do you get into last mile delivery? Do you, what is, I I predicted incorrectly seven years ago that Uber would take on Amazon prime fulfillment, that you would be in the business of last mile. What's the third leg? If it's, if it's ride hailing, and there might not be a third leg. If it's ride hailing and food delivery, is it is there a third leg, and what is that? Um, it's it's ride hailing is going to turn into mobility. So anyway, getting uh, point A to B, it might be our uh, uh, drivers who use our network. It might be taxi cabs. It might be mass transit. Anyway, you want to get from point mm-hmm. A to B, all the information real time, payments done, incredibly smooth. And then on the delivery side, it's going to go from food. We're already in groceries. And essentially, we're going into every other local commerce category. So Amazon's going to have a huge business, and they've gone from three days to two bit days to one uh, one day, et cetera. We're going to go from 30 minutes, you know, five minutes for rides, to 30 minutes and extend. And we want to build that real-time logistics local engine. Uh, and again, it's about people and things. And the frequency uh, that we have with customers, it's going to be Pretty incredible. I think that's a good way good way to put it. People and things, and stay tuned because uh, on the ride share we're going to be covering a lot more of the things side too. You know, like he said, it's not just food delivery; it's also the logistics. You know, I kind of that whole last mile basically of anything, food items, whatever it might be. All right, Dara, we really appreciate it. Wish we had more time. There's so many areas to talk about, including scooters and stuff like that. We appreciate you being here. And again, we're so excited for your employee representation on the board. We're, uh, you know, a driver representative. It's going to be great. I'm excited when you announce that, like, next week. Um, And we'll see what happens this week in California and how that goes. Uh, So this is going to be a a big week for you, I think. And we, uh, no. Uh, okay, but, but, okay, luck. We're wishing someone like Dara. We are wishing people luck. luck. Please, it's a better way. It's a better way. Actually, okay. let's, right. let's wish for something I, that I think drivers it's your want. way. It's, it's, it's yeah. a way. It's a way. I, I'm not going to pick it. Yeah, okay. Right. And I want drivers to get paid well and be protected. I'd love you to have a great business all together. How's that? I'd That's like everybody to win. Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right, Dara, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank Thanks, you. Sarah. All right. And that's a wrap. Great job, Kara, Scott, and uh, Dara. I, uh, this was kind of fun format for me. I think I talked maybe about half the time. So let me know in the comments, the feedback, uh, if I did too much talking, I'm assuming that's going to be, if anyone does have negative feedback, I'm assuming they'll say I probably did too much talking, which is, hey, you know, I like to talk. So if you don't know that about me by now, then uh, you probably don't know me that well, but uh, that's one of my things. And uh, this was fun for me. So hopefully you guys enjoyed it. If you did, uh, I'll definitely do more in the future. And if 
if you're listening over on the podcast, you can also head over to YouTube where uh, you can actually see a lot of the facial expressions that I made in between uh, my talking and uh, Kara and Scott and Dara talking about all this. So definitely interesting stuff. And I really just enjoyed this interview and also really enjoy uh, Kara and Scott's content. So highly recommend that you check out their podcast. I'll leave a link to Pivot so that you guys can check out their show this episode specifically, but I also recommend that you subscribe to their show, uh, Pivot in iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. All right, uh, over and out. Take care, everyone.